he is just the nicest person in the world, and you will recognize all of this, and it's going to take you to a happier place. So with that, let me call up Rob Paulson. Thank you. Hello, Denver. All right, let's get this out of the way. United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru, Republic, Dominican, Cuba, Caribbean, Greenland, El Salvador, too, Puerto Rico, Colombia, Venezuela, Honduras, Guyana, and still Guatemala, Bolivia, then Argentina, Ecuador, Chile, Brazil, Costa Rica, Belize, Nicaragua, Bermuda, Bahamas, Tobago, San Juan, Paraguay, Uruguay, Suriname, and Prince Guyana, Barbados, and Guam, Norway, and Sweden, and Iceland, and Finland, and Germany, now on peace, Switzerland, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Italy, Turkey, and Greece, Poland, Romania, Scotland, Albania, Ireland, Russia, Oman, Bulgaria, Saudi Arabia, Hungary, Cyprus, Iraq, and Iran. There's Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, both Yemen's Kuwait and Bahrain. The Netherlands, Luxembourg, Belgium, and Portugal, France, India, Denmark, and Spain. India, Pakistan, Burma, Afghanistan, Thailand, Nepal, and Bhutan. Campuchia, Malaysia, then Bangladesh, Asia, and China, Korea, Japan. Mongolia, Laos, and Tibet, Indonesia, the Philippine Islands, Taiwan. Sri Lanka, New Guinea, Sumatra, New Zealand, and Borneo, and Vietnam. Tunisia, Morocco, Uganda, Angola, Zimbabwe, Djibouti, Botswana, Mozambique, Zambia, Swaziland, Gambia, Guinea, Algeria, Ghana. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Burundi, Lesotho, and Malawi, Togo, the Spanish Sahara is gone. Niger, Nigeria, Chad, and Liberia, Egypt, Benin, and Gabon, Tanzania, Somalia, Kenya, and Mali, Sierra Leone, and Algier. Dahomey, Namibia, Senegal, Libya, Cameroon, Congo, Zaire, Ethiopia, Guinea, Bissau, Madagascar, Rwanda, Mayor, and Cayman, Hong Kong, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, Yugoslavia, Kuwait, Mauritania, then Pennsylvania, Monaco, Lignes, and Malta, and Palestine, Fiji, Australia, Sudan. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I wrote that on the way over. <laughs> Just this thing that I do. Um, it, it is really, honestly, such an incredible joy to be here. I have friends, relatives uh, whom I love with all my heart and soul, and new fans and friends that I've gotten to meet, and we've known each other for 30 years, and we didn't know that we knew each other. How cool is that? Um, but it truly is a, a joyful thing, and Sarah is not only incredibly easy on the eyes, but... And I've only had half a drink, baby, so it ain't the booze. The fact that I'm twice as old as you notwithstanding. I was, I'm getting, getting a little older, I was in fact the entertainment at the Last Supper. <clears throat> in those days, I went by Shecky of Arimathea. Jesus, what a party, really. It, um, it was, it was really going well until Judas got up and did, you know, karaoke backstabbers, which I thought was kind of <laughs> cheesy. But no, I've been around for a long time, and you guys have been there the whole time. And what's really lovely about things like this, Nerd Night, uh, the instantaneous nature of social media, all of these conventions that are springing up all over the place, the great thing is that now I get to come and meet people um, you know, like Joe and Mindy and Ivy and all these folks whom I've, uh, we've sort of been in each other's lives for 30 years, and now I get a chance to come and meet people, and it is really an incredible joy and, and honor uh, to be here. Um, what I think we'll probably do, and Sarah and I talked about it, is I'll kind of give you an overview of something that is important to me with respect to, you know, what it is that I do for a living, and... Um, uh, and also, just a quick plug, for those of you who like Animaniacs and that goofy little song, um, there are going to be 19 other ones tomorrow night that are going to be performed by the Colorado Symphony Orchestra. I'm telling you what, you guys got a hell of a band in this town. Man. 80 pieces, and, and we were rehearsing today, and I got to tell you, it, it, it's going to be really excellent. So, if you are so inclined and uh, you're not... Um, you know, uh, uh, on a work release situation where you, I know you are, um, where you have to be back, you know, at home, home, and your ankle bracelet is not too intrusive, then please come to, come to see us tomorrow night. It's great fun. You have not only yours truly, but Wacko and Dot, Tress McNeil and Jess Harnell will be there as well. Um, 
Randy Rogel, who wrote Yakko's World and all the other ones, uh, is going to be there performing and with the incredible Colorado Symphony Orchestra. So it's a hell of a lot of fun. Um, the, the thing that I thought I would talk about initially before we do Q&A is um, that uh, we've already, I've already met several people here who have come up to me and said, you know, I've kind of had uh, um, an interest in voice acting. And one of the things I'd like to touch on is like any other art form, and that is to say that it is really driven, I think, by, by passion. And, and the important thing is the acting part of it. Um, I've been really fortunate to do, I didn't even know I did that one. <laughs> Somebody owes me some money, that's great. Um, I think the, the important thing to remember, like any other artistic endeavor, is it's, it's not just about you know, the, the sort of parlor trick and the funny voice. And I'm not saying that for sort of self-aggrandizement. I'm doing my gig, I've been doing it a long time. But all of the people whom you would like, Billy West, Maurice LaMarche, Frank Welker, Peter Cullen, uh, Tress McNeil, Nancy Cartwright, you know, all those people, every, virtually every one of us has a performance background, that is to say live music, stand-up, improv, uh, all of that. So it really is about the acting part. And I can't tell you how many CDs I get from people saying, Hey, Mr. Paulson, would you please listen to my CD? Because uh, I do a killer SpongeBob. <laughs> and that's great. But Tom Kenny, who does SpongeBob, the last I checked, is still breathing. <laughs> and he's not going to give up that gig without a fight. So uh, if, for those of you who are interested, um, it, it, I would suggest, and I spoke to my young friend earlier here about this very thing, I would suggest that you do do things that get you in situations like this where you're allowed to perform in front of, uh, of folks, whether you, you perform at church, whether you perform improv groups. There must there have to be improv groups in, in, in Denver, uh, right? Yeah. That is really, really, really good training for what we do because when you go into the studio, uh, you know, I'm, I, we're all regulars on certain shows, but often the producer will throw you a curve and say, hey, Rob, you be the talking m monkey with a bubble on his head or something like that. And, of course, all of the chemical inducement notwithstanding from 25 years ago that kicks in just at the right time. Um, that's a joke, Judy. She, she knows my family. Um, of course, for you, hell, you're a hippie, Tom. You don't care, Chico. Yeah. Um, and um, I always say when I come out, I say, hi, Denver, or hi, Denver. You know, <laughs> high comma Denver, question mark? Yeah, woo! Um, so yeah, it, it, improv is fantastic, and if you, if you uh, do live theater, great training, um, because, uh, you know, Sarah was saying such really lovely things, and I, I hear that quite a bit, and I often find that the characters that me and my really gifted friends get to do often have a much deeper connection with people way, way, way over and above action figures and money and ratings, all of which, of course, it is called show business and we need to make a living. But um, I met Joe and his family tonight and it was such a joy to meet the three of them and you could tell the, the connection to the characters that just that I did, irrespective of all the ones that all the other people do, it was very important. And consequently, then it's important to me and that is not an accident. And it's not as a result of just sort of saying, you know, I make a funny voice. It's, it really is about um, giving a, a soul to that. Um, the really coolest thing about this, and for those of you who are, gonna, who are actors who want to pursue this, is that one day you will do your gig and one day you will meet somebody 20 years down the road who will come up to you and say, man, I'm telling you what, if it weren't for Pinky and the Brain, I, my mother, the only thing that got her through her chemo treatments was Pinky and the Brain. Now, it, that is an incalculable gift for me, right? So if you're lucky enough to do something like that, that has a really powerful connection vis-a-vis -vis your artwork and something that you would do for free anyway, then go for it. And I also told this young man earlier, it really isn't about, um, you know, it's nice to make money doing something about which you're passionate. Um, but if you aren't, that doesn't mean that you still can't be passionate to go and play your clarinet or, or you know, act or do improv or whatever you want that satisfies your soul. And you also have the benefit of having YouTube now, man. You've got this free platform to put your stuff out there where millions of people can see your stuff right now. And whether they like it or not really is kind of immaterial. It's an opportunity for you to share your gift, right? So go for it. Anyway, that's my little, my little um, proselytizing about voice acting sort of thing. Um, I think probably because we have limited time and we've got other really fabulous speakers here, 
which presumes that I'm calling myself really fabulous. I didn't mean it that way. We've got really fabulous speakers and me. So I would like to take this opportunity to um, open the floor up to any questions because that would really be, um, wow, the question's up. There. Okay, you. I don't see you, but that's never stopped me before. Um, this beautiful lady in here has a, on the red t-shirt, you have a question, sweetie. Oh, now, wait a minute. That, what is your name? Heather. Hi, Heather. Heather, God bless her. She, you know, Sarah put this together. What the hell's the matter with you, Sarah? Where's Ian Wazalewski? <laughs> Sarah busts her button. You're so sweet. The first thing she says, I, I noticed the absence of Ian Wazalewski. <laughs> Maybe it's just me, but... Better be careful walking to your car, baby. Um, no, thank you for bringing that up. That was on a show called Teacher's Pet for Disney. Yeah, Ian is one of them. Ian Wadalewski was this guy who... He it was kind of a knockoff of um, a little bit of... Uh, I stole, because he's dead, I stole um, from um, Hervé Villachez. You know the plane? Hello, bud. You are that guy right there, you know? Yeah, because he's taking a dirt nap, I figure he's not using the voice anymore. <laughs> but that, that happens a lot, actually, because when you take that, uh, that, that sound, it's, he had a French accent, but if you get rid of that, you've got this, and then you make this sort of wet sound. And uh, he was a real booger-eating spaz, as I recall. <laughs> yeah. um, that character, I thought, was underrated, because that was a very good show, Teacher's Pet. Really cool. It actually was a pretty good little movie. I think it was direct to DVD. Was it direct to DVD, or was it released in a... It was released in the theater? Yeah, that was actually a pretty good little movie. Um, but that happens a lot. I know that... Um, for instance, I do a character on Animaniacs, which I will be doing tomorrow night, and get to sing um, uh, a character called Dr. Scratch and Sniff, who is the... Thank you. He is the, st the studio of peace psychiatrist, you know. And I, I took this voice from Peter Sellers because he was Dr. Strangelove, you know. But the truth is, you know, if you get rid of the German accent and you're here, and you sound a little Kermity, right? But then you, you keep that right in the back of your throat, and then you throw in a kind of an accent like this, yes, and you can do some, you know, countryfied. But then if you, if, you, if you move that into the front of your voice, you're kind of doing yakko, but then you get rid of the, you add a, a kind of a b break, voice breaking like this, and you're Pat Buttram all of a sudden. <laughs> and I have a, um, for those of you who don't remember, and those of you who are the TV land generation, if you watch Green Acres, he, he was Mr. Haney, right? And he spoke like that in real life. That was the coolest thing because he really did sound like that. He was uh, Gene Autry's sidekick, I think, right, in the years ago. And I met him, oh my God, he was probably in his 80s when I met him at a studio in LA 20 years ago. And he was a vaudeville guy. Man, he had all of his jokes still right here. And I said, oh God, Mr. Buttram. I was actually doing a show called The Fox, Fox and the Hounds for Disney, in which I ripped him off from the original because he didn't want to do it. And, I figured I'd do it, and they hired me, and I saw him in the lobby, and I said, oh my God, you know, Mr. Butterman, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I have to tell you, I've, I've stolen your voice on mother, more than one occasion. He said, oh, well, that's all right, son. I ain't using it much no more. <laughs> and then, and then I said, I just wanted to keep talking to this TV icon, right? It was cool to meet this guy. I said, how are you? How you doing? Without missing a beat. Man, I'm great. I just met me a $5 hooker who validates. <laughs> Is that a great line? Man, that was great, baby. Now, if you could punch my ticket, I'll get the truck out the gay garage and go home and shower with Purell or something. <laughs> but um, thank you for bringing up Ian Wazalewski. I think, I think another, one, another one that I really like a lot is... Oh, you're laughing. That's a good sign. I don't know. Oh, what did I do? Oh, there I am. I don't know where the pointer is with this, but it... What, honey? On the side? Thank you. This is my lovely assistant, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. What's it? Where? In the ear? Green, the green button. Oh, whoop. Jesus, God, it's a good thing I don't have my hand on the button for the nuclear war. There we are. Um, where did I go? Uh... Where am I? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This guy right here. That's Carl Weezer from Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius. 
And um, I think he's a really good character. And, and he says, um, I don't really get a lot of chicks. I, well, I take that back. I get a lot of baby chickens. <laughs> I, it's weird. I do get a lot of phone numbers, so there's that. From the chickens, which is weird. Um, so anyway, yeah, thank you. Anybody else have a question um, about? The... Yes, ma'am. Have there been any characters that you, when you finished working for the day, you thought, I kind of wish I could hang out with them a little bit more? Oh, that you thought I, that, that I would like to hang out with that guy? You know what, Raphael, yeah, I gotta say, um, yeah, this guy right here. Um, Cause he's a, he was a kind of a smart ass, which clearly I don't have any trouble with. <laughs> I have my fabulous cousin, Tom Tchaikovsky, who lives in Evergreen, he's here, and you can vouch for that, right? I can do the smart ass. Yeah, I just opened my mouth to change feet. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it would have been cool hanging out with, with Raphael. I really dug that guy. Uh, Yakko's kind of the same way, you know, because he could get people up to the water tower. That was pretty cool. Um, the, the, uh, the thing that's really great um, about what I do, kind of a throwback to the initial thing we were chatting about with respect to voice acting, is another great thing about this gig is that I'm, well, maybe except you, Chico, I'm the oldest guy in this room. Maybe a couple of people, it might be two or three years. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Um, but, Whenever I go to work, I'm virtually the oldest guy around. And what's really cool is that nobody cares about that. I did Raphael for, what, eight or nine years, and I have to thank, please, all of you in your 30s, please thank your parents for buying action figures, because my kids' teeth are straight today <laughs> as a result of your parents' generosity. Um, but what's really great about this thing is that nobody cares that I'm a middle-aged white guy. Uh, Ninja Turtles is back on the air on Nickelodeon, and it's really good because the people who are making it are 35 or 40. They grew up in their turtle fanatics. But I'm now Donatello. I get to be a, another turtle 25 years later, and nobody cares about this, right? About my hair is white. Um, so that's another cool thing about, about not having to fit the suit. But yeah, those characters are a couple that I probably would have liked to hang out with. How about you? Is there anyone that you would have particularly liked to hang out with? Just so you can, you know, kind of tell me. Yeah. Hello, nurse. <laughs> Thank you. Who else has a question? Anybody else have a question? Yes, sir. Um, yes. It's, it's both. If I'm a regular on a show and it's a big casting issue, then we generally have a couple of callbacks. Once you get the job, you then get, um, they call it a, a Bible, a story Bible of the, you know, they have maybe 26 or however many episodes mapped out, and they kind of give you synopses of all the episodes and how the characters interact with one another. Pardon me, but often I'll go do an, a show and I'll be the, a guest on a show like Penguins of Madagascar or whatever, and they'll just throw and say, okay, Rob, today you're this guy, or you're, you know, you're, you've got this, what have you got? And that's where the, uh, the improv stuff really helps, because what you don't want to do is get that opportunity, and at the beginning, of course, they're few and far between, because the competition, as it is in any part of show, or really anything that you want to do, is it's, it's, it's competitive, but it should be. And um, so when you get those opportunities, you don't want to freeze and go, oh my God, I, I don't know what to do with that. You want to say, sure, I got something. And, um, often what happens is I'll get an, an, uh, an opportunity to do something and they'll say, um, you know, we see this character as kind of a Don Knotts sort of weird Barney Fife thing, you know, on acid or... Um, <laughs> and I say, well, it's also, there's a huge honor among thieves between voice actors. It's a very loyal group of people. And I have to tell you guys, if, if all the people that I've had... By the way, I have a podcast that you guys are listen should listen to. It's free. It's great, and you will love it. Everybody, Mark Hamill, who is, is best known for the Joker as he was for saving the universe, right? But all these actors have been on it. It's called Talkin' Tunes, T-A-L-K-I-N-T-O-O-N-S. It's free. It's on iTunes. Listen to it. It's really great. Um, and all the people you, whom you'll hear are the nicest, most unpretentious, incredibly gifted people. Uh, and they'll say, you know, the guy for this is, you don't want me, you want Rob Paulson. So I'll do the same thing. I'll say, you know, I do a pretty good... I do a bad impression of Jeff Bennett doing a great impression of Barney Fife. And so they'll say, but, well, let's hear what you got. Because, you know, let, let me just hear it. So I'll do my kind of version of Barney Fife and just see what I can do. And 
throw that, come here, Otis, I'm not afraid to hug a man, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and they'll say, wow, you know, that's pretty good, and, and it's, it's actually not spot on, and it turns out it's better for what we're looking for, and then I end up doing, uh, you know, 15 or 20 episodes of a show where if I had been, you know, too freaked out about the fact that I didn't do a perfect impression, I might have aced myself out of a gig, right? So it really is about being confident in your ability to be able to say, sure, and if they say, eh, thanks, that's not right, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained, but um, so it happens both ways. Um, and characters do often morph a little bit. Um, I did a character, where was that fellow? Right here. Many of you like him, I suppose. Where did he go? This one, where is he? Oh, yes, right here. Narf! <laughs> yes! I really like that fellow. He's so stupid. <laughs> and, um, and, and Pinky, actually, his sound has kind of morphed over the years. Um, but you know what? If you hear bugs from the 40s and you hear bugs from the 70s or 60s, it's different, and it's not just that Mel Blanc was getting older. There were some things that the producers liked better. And so that's typical. If you're lucky enough to have a job that long, the characters will morph a little bit. Anybody else have a... Yo, thank you. Yes, sir. Oh my God, well we were here, we, we came here, right Tom? We came here to the Wonder Brothers store, yeah. I miss those places, that was great fun. Um, two quick questions, one, one was fun and one was a joke. The, the fun one is, did you ever hear from in any way the Dana Delaney? Dana Delaney, we did, because Dana Delaney was, played Lois Lane on uh, the Warner Brothers animated version of Superman. So um, yeah, I saw Dana quite a bit, and um, she was, uh, actually quite flattered. She said, I can't believe you guys threw my name. I said, well, if your name was Meryl Streepy, we wouldn't say, here's the show's name, or, you know, animated, totally insane, Meryl Streepy, that wouldn't work. But Dana Delaney worked like Eisenhower Mamie, totally insane, you know, Pinky and the Brainy. Um, so yeah, she was very sweet and stunningly beautiful, very, very nice lady. Yeah, what's your serious question? How does an idiot like me continue to make a living? <laughs> From your lips to God's checkbook, my friend. In the modern world, do you find yourself, do you still go into the studio? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. I have a, I don't really have a home studio. I have a home facility. But, man, I've gotten gigs out of, you know, pull over my car under a tree, and, and they'll say, hey, Disney wants to hear you read this thing, and I'm kind of running out of time, and I take my iPad and plug in my little handheld mic, pull over, and I do the gig and send, find a Starbucks, pull in front, use the Wi-Fi, and send it. It's crazy. Yeah, but as far as work goes, no, we all go to studios. Um, if I were a promo guy, I'm an actor, so if I were a guy that just did commercials or promos, I think a lot of folks do that from their homes and have fancy studios that make the, the, the product as air ready from their home. It certainly is doable, um, but for those of us who are, pr are primarily actors, and I still do a lot of singing, um, so I always go to the studios, and I prefer it. It's, it's so, oh my God, if you could really hang out with these people and, and you go get paid to be with people that you would choose to spend your free time with, it's, you don't want to not be there. It's a, it's a pretty miraculous way to make a living. It's, um, you know, with all due respect to uh, Lou Gehrig, I think I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth, you know. Um, does anybody else have a question? Any more? Got one back? Oh, hi. Well, I think we all know the answer to that, don't we? I, um, I, I know, I gotta say, what's really flattering is that none of that stuff, none of the minutia about the backstory or the sort of soft, dark underbelly of the pinky in the brain ethos, none of that shit made any difference to us. Not because we didn't think it's cool, but you know, we, again, that was the er, mid-90s, so we didn't have Twitter, the internet was sort of just coming up. Well, now, you know, all these people who have grown up watching it put all this backstory into it, which is fabulous. And I have to tell you that, well, new shows aren't being made, but the very fact that a, a, a top-tier orchestra in the United States, in the world, frankly, came to us and said, hey, we would really love to do this show because the Animaniacs music is fantastic, um, that was 20 years ago. That speaks really highly of the quality of the show and the fact that it did not condescend to the audience and was clearly written on a couple of different levels. So we were too stupid to see that. 
Really, everybody else is going, hmm, you know, when he said this, I think what he really meant was this, because if you look at the Knights Templar, are you kidding me? And we're going, yeah, okay, great. Have another hit off that big hooter, dude, you know. You could do that here with impunity. So, um, uh, I, 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 but I do, think, I do think there's a lot to be said about the fact that, that, that Pinky um, was a lot smarter than he let on. Um, and I have to tell you, the love for that show is astonishing. Maurice LaMarche and I were together last weekend in Portland doing a, a show, and the audience, uh, they just adore Pinky and the Brain. Um, and when Mo, there's another guy, absolutely the most delightful, talented, unpretentious, giving, sweet. He would stay here all night and just meet her, and just be going, oh my God, I can't believe you like me. And like Sally Field with 100 extra pounds. And, um, <laughs> And, it, and it's, it's, it's really great. People just love that show. And again, I think it's because we're having this sort of renaissance because the mean age of the people in here are folks who grew up watching that stuff. And it hits you right in the childhood. It's nostalgic. But it's also really good. And today we were all rehearsing with the orchestra. And what was so sweet was to look out at 80 beautiful faces, all of whom are world-class players. But the mean age of the orchestra is probably 40-ish, maybe late 30s. And those kids were just... It's time for Animaniacs. They were freaking out. And so that is a, that's a huge gift. And, and, um, and I was very grateful to have being, you know, Tom Ruger who created that and Tiny Toons and all that. And Mr. Spielberg, you know, getting to, a chance to work with, uh, with those people. Um, I think the proof is in the pudding. 20 years later, clearly their, their vision and the fact that they wrote it for exactly for people to come up with questions like that. Seriously, years later, shows what, you know, what that they were thinking. So uh, thank, you for, thank you for even bringing that. By the way, what is your name? Cole. Cole? Okay, ask me, Pinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? <laughs> well, I think so, Cole, but me and Pippi Longstocking, I mean, what would the children look like? <laughs> That's good. Okay, thanks, sweetie. Okay, we have one more question. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> Only certain times of the month. And let's face it, honey, when you're my age, the only thing hot about chicks my age are the flashes. So, you know, it's... Uh... And I only say that because I've been married for 32 years. My wife would say, shut up, you asshole. <laughs> so, she's not here. I can get away with that. Um, a different mindset, I guess a little bit. But, you know, the, the, um, I, I haven't been... Hot... Well, I take that back. I was actually hired to play a female character uh, on, on a, an animated version, which I didn't think was nearly as good as the original version. There was a great show on H, I think it was HBO, I don't remember. Remember Fraggle Rock, the Muppet Fraggle Rock? That was a great show. And then we did an animated version for a year on NBC, which I didn't think was very good, but nonetheless, I, I got to do a few characters on that, one of which was a female trash heap. Named, her name was Marjorie the Trash Heap. And um, I did... Tom and I are from, uh, our respective mothers are from uh, Eastern Europe uh, background, Macedonian background. So I sort of did her like, um, it was like Maria Ospenskaya. You know, I say, oh, I'm, a, I'm a big trash here, but look, you're crazy. You're a very beautiful girl. You come up here and I look, don't you talking to me? I was not born tomorrow, you know. <laughs> um, and then I played, I do play Carl. I play Carl Weezer's mom and dad. And... Um, his dad is kind of a big, uh, well, he's a booger-eating spaz, too. And, um, and um, his mom is, um, his mom is like, almost like Harvey Fierstein. Come here, Carl, right? Great big, you know, S's. People ask me if I'm gay. I say, gay, I'm ecstatic. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, but I think, I think, honestly, it goes more the other way. There are more women who do boy characters and men characters. Like Debbie Derryberry was Jimmy... Well, how about that for a name? Debbie Derryberry. <laughs> and I can have a kid named Larry. Larry De Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> um, but Debbie was Jimmy Neutron. Of course, you know, Nancy Cartwright has been Bart Simpson for 30 years. Um, 
uh, E.G. Daly and Tara Strong. Tara is, I, I, I do a character in uh, uh, Fairly Odd Parents called Mark Chang, who's an alien from Yugo Potamia. I see you back there going, <laughs> All right, excellent. <laughs> yeah. Drink that bong water. Woo. Um, and, and, but uh, Timmy Turner, the lead in the show, is played by Tara Strong, who is, you know. Um, so it usually goes, goes that way, but either way, it beats the hell out of lifting stuff. It's a really great gig. You know? <laughs> so you guys, thank you so much for having me. And see you tomorrow night. Night. Thank you, honey.